Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the annual Coral Courts Lecture. I'm Montserrat Bombay Rosé. I want to begin by acknowledging that the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts is located on the traditional and ancestral land of Osage Nation, the original inhabitants of what is now known St. Louis. We pay respect to the people of those tribes, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Osage people. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm and support tribal sovereignty, history, and experiences by endless generations through their continued connection to this land, the land where we reside, occupy, and call home. Tonight's lecture was established in 1995 by Corinna Kotzen and her husband, Lee Rosenbaum. Kotzen earned a master's degree in architecture and construction management from Washington University in 1983. She entered the field of construction management and founded Edice Complex. She resides in Santa Monica, California with her family. Her daughter Chiara graduated from WashU in 1915. Kotzen's mother, Joanne Stolaroff Kotzen, studied fashion design at Washington University. Corina Kotzen served as a trustee of the university, chair of the Los Angeles Regional Cabin Cabinet, and member of the San Fox School National Council. So let me now introduce you who is honoring this lecture tonight, Fernanda Canales. Our guest is an architect based in Mexico City with vast work in designing housing and public buildings, proposing urban planning designs and research in Mexican architecture, past and present. She holds a PhD in architecture from the ETSAM Madrid, a master's from the ETSAP Barcelona, and completes her architecture education when she started at Ibero uh, Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. As a designer, her work moves across the scales, always questioning what is public, private, or common at the domestic, urban, and even planetary scale. She affirms that her projects rather ask more questions than answer them, or providing solutions. Her work embraces the duality of contraries like public-private, scarce generous, or urban-rural, which most of her work always revealing that. But our guest is also vastly known for her research publications, from the several books that she has published going in depth into housing research and its relationship with the city, I would like to highlight the two volumes of Architecture in Mexico, 1900-2010. And as you can see, it's not a light work. Um, where the 20th century Mexican architecture has been dissected, observed, and put back together in a series of interwoven topic timelines. The spots that needed to be brought to the, for to the forefront. This is already a seminal piece where our guests urge to find new ways of seeing, rearranging, and re-understanding what was the history of the past century of Mexican design, making sure that the forgotten is now resurfaced and reevaluate. Her work has been exhibited in lots of institutions. I will just mention the Royal Academy of Arts in London and the Venice Biennale in multiple occasions. In her own words, teaching is learning, but learning is also unlearning. Her teaching guides students to question what we assume as given, since it is not the absolute truth, but it's rather fragments. She has brought this approach to her studios at Harvard Graduate School of Design, Princeton School of Architecture, and Yale School of Architecture. Finally, our guest has been distinguished, distinguished sorry, with several international awards, such as the 2018 Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League of New York, where she's now serving as jury member. She has been named one of the world's 100 and plus best architecture firms by Domus Magazine and was recognized by the New York Times as one of the 10 female figures changing the landscape of leadership in the world. I would like to conclude by saying I see our guest as a surfer, moving skillfully on the surface of the waves, advancing smoothly between design, research, and teaching, and finding the core waves of the vast landscape of our discipline. Please help me welcome Fernanda Canales. Thank you, 
you for such a generous uh, introduction and for this invitation. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here. Thank you, everyone that could join us tonight. And um, well, I'm going to speak about my most recent projects, especially from the past six years, but most of them just from last year. And uh, with the title of going from rooms to communities, trying to speak less and less about bedrooms, about buildings, and more and more about people, about the environment, and about the relationship between constructions, living entities, and the context. So I'll show tonight um, 12 projects. I have paired them in groups to have a broad understanding of the different scales and the different programs that I approach. So uh, the first two projects are residential um, houses um, in rural Mexico. The other two are for low-income projects as well in rural communities. Then two uh, public buildings in Sonora in the desert. Then two sports facilities two community centers or civic centers uh, in Naco and Agua Prieta in the border cities. And then my last two projects, one is a house and the other one is a community center. And it's a, a way of speaking about the different approaches and the different scopes of my work. I have worked in um, restoration and preservation issues, also in cultural and public facilities working for residential and commercial client-based programs, um, deeply interested in housing solutions, despite uh, having to deal with the high density solutions in Mexico City, um, achieving other ways of reinventing the domestic typology, and also working in small scale temporary interventions or installations um, with materials that are, are really what I find in sight and trying to achieve other ways of understanding and looking at what we already have, uh, looking at the existent. And also, as Tad said, uh, interested in research and understanding writing as another way of doing architecture and not only focusing in the buildings per se, but the effects of buildings in the cities and in the lives of people. So trying to really question the role of architects and um, how to approach or how are we dealing with these vast uh, real landscapes. Where are architects um, in this image? For example, this is Mexico City, the place where I live and work. It's an image by Melanie Smith. Um, and especially considering that in Mexico, more, more than 70% of what's being built is done informally. That is, without acknowledging the need of architects or of any kind of specialist. So what, how can we be more useful in society? Um, and what are architects really doing? What are... Um, especially considering um, this image. This is for um, it's the earthquake in Mexico City, 2017. So more interested in what's happening between one bed and the, the next, or, or one house and the next, the space in between, the collective consequences of individual desires, and what happens um, in between of what uh, belongs to one but affects us all in a city that recurrently shakes, sinks, and floods. So what are the, the implications of our designs and the implications of architecture in general? Uh, especially trying to shake uh, myths, the, um, the power of architecture to solve everything. You know, in this image, you, you don't need to change your family, just change your house. So um, topics related to ownership, to privacy, to um, housing in general. Uh, Mexico is one of the countries with more scarcity of homes in the world. 
And it's also, paradoxically, it's also one of the countries with more abandoned houses, with more empty, vacant houses. And most of them are new. And that is because they're built far away uh, with no links to public transport or to schools, jobs, uh, insecurity, violence. So uh, what are we really working um, for or working at? Or whom are we working for? Um, and especially questioning this um, universal uh, role of the architect with how much distant are we still planning our cities, still planning our um, buildings, our sites, and um, especially considering the realities of the place where I work and uh, speaking more uh, about the people in the communities and less about the clients and trying to communicate better um, the relationship between the dweller, the inhabitant, the people who actually build the places, and uh, the people who need to actually understand and, and with whom we need to communicate. So um, shifting or trying to go beyond the images, these are a couple of uh, collages that I did, questioning the um, roles of architects and the roles the, the gender divisions, the social, the economical divisions that our cities foster, that our buildings promote, and trying to find other ways of creating cities, other ways of growing architecture or understanding our built environment, uh, and fighting for a world not divided um, into spheres, a world not composed of walls, but uh, rather of uh, places or of communities. And um, considering the real scenarios, these are two images by the photographer Jorge Taboada. This is in Monterrey, in a place where I grew up. And this is what's being built every, every day, thousands of times. And it can be Mexico, it can be any other uh, country in the world. So I try to relate my work with other ways of connecting or communicating it. In this case, an exhibition where I mapped and, and built one room of the typical, the standard house, that this, any of these houses, the ones that are being built uh, millions of times, and uh, taking the discussions outwards. In this case, in a gallery space, uh, but I also um, write books and, and do research, trying to figure out other ways of uh, taking the discussions further. Um, in this case, it's a standard house, 32 square meters for um, average family of four or five members. This is the second bedroom, the kids' bedroom. I placed a standard uh, size individual mattress in the bedroom and the door could not open. And this is a room for one kid. Usually there are three people or even four sleeping in that bedroom. So what are the real effects and the real architecture that's being produced and promoted? And the small accidents that occur every day, when you multiply it by millions, then you have the effects in society that we are encountering. Uh, for example, if somebody is sitting in the dining room, you cannot go out of the bathroom. Or if somebody opens the fridge or the oven, you cannot enter or exit the kitchen. So things that seem to be like oh, just minor details, if they are not physically understood, even, even by the developers or the construction companies or by architects ourselves, it's difficult to imagine what happens inside the walls that we actually never enter or rarely enter. Um, in this case, an installation in the Zócalo in Mexico City. Again, trying to take the discussions out towards the street and make people participate, non-architects. And we draw the, the demarcations, the political demarcations. It was an installation that took four days. And in one, we just painted the lacustre condition. It's a city that's um, built on top, literally on top of the lake. And still today, we are paving rivers and lakes. Um, it's a, a city that could be self-sufficient in just storing rainwater for 20 million people that live there. 
but we send 90% of rainwater directly to the sewage. So making all of these um, discussions more public or uh, trying to involve different audiences in the discussions, considering the natural reserve areas that are still there today but are being um, built with self-construction uh, and formal settlements and also understanding the different layers, the different, different decisions of city making and how can we still um, impact our policies and our decisions um, to improve the, the landscape and um, get rid of the misconceptions or the absurdities in the ways we are constructing. So uh, the 12 projects that I, I will show it's in a, in a way an excuse, in, in every case it's an excuse to rethink some of the, the issues that I've mentioned, the ones that Tat also spoke about. In this case, Casa Bruma, uh, the, the two houses that I will show next are residential houses for weekend uh, homes for privileged cl clients in a place two hours and a half from Mexico City, two hour and a half drive. And it's a green landscape, a very privileged uh, virgin area. But the brief uh, became a completely different situation that what I thought at the, the first interviews with the client or even what the client thought he was asking for. It was for a young couple uh, with two babies. They wanted the, just the standard program for a weekend house, uh, three bedrooms, and then they asked for another place for the caretaker's house. It, they, they needed a, a pe people who lived there all year round. And it was not just one caretaker because they usually have a wife and they usually have kids. So it became not just a program of one house for one family. It became a house for two families, one that was going to be living there permanently and they were not the owners. And then the owners coming and living uh, every weekend. And they also wanted to include their extended family, their in-laws and host guests in independent um, like bungalows or houses. So it suddenly became a house for three families at least and sometimes even four or five. So the decision was to make sort of an exploded house. It also had to do with the site. The site had a uh, very steep uh, topography and the usual place uh, to to locate the house was this, it, it was the the easiest uh, spot in, in the house. This is a forest, it had a lot of trees we couldn't touch or um, change any of the, the vegetation. So the client thought he wanted just one house and in this area and then it resulted to three houses and I thought it would be even better to place it on the part where you still have some kind of forest but you have privacy, it was a um, development that was be being built, so we knew he was going to have four neighbors, but still the houses were not built. We were one of the first houses in the development, so it was uncertain, uh, the views, the how tall, how big would the neighbors be, so trying to maintain the house really um, in a place where you could control the, the views and the privacy. And also it's a place that has uh, winter and summer every day. You wake up at zero degrees Celsius and then every uh, afternoon it's really, really hot and then you have winter again during the night. So trying to achieve two or three different orientations in every volume and having cross ventilation. So uh, the program is, as I said before, an exploded house to be able to have the caretaker house independent then the house with the kitchen, dining room, and living room, which is like the, the main house, and then having two volumes for guests to house. Um, and everything is uh, surrounded by um, the courtyard, which is the place the, to store rainwater. There are houses that are not connected to a water system or drainage, or um, they, they produce their own electricity as well. So the idea was to shift the volumes depending on the trees and the orientations. It was really something that had to be adjusted in the site and depending as well uh, regarding the topography. 
So what you have is a, a house that uh, seems to be an interior, but it's suddenly an exterior, and it's the courtyard. So it links all of the different programs of the house, mm -hmm. and you have different views to unexpected areas. You have, like, every volume has its own private exterior and then its own common exterior as well. And uh, the idea was to make the house disappear in the landscape. It is made... Um, cast it inside with concrete, with pigmented in black, because it was very important. We didn't want uh, to see the house and you know, to um, damage the, the landscape. And if you see the shades produced by the trees, it becomes like a, really a black uh, shade. So we decided to make the house with black concrete in order to make it camouflage. We had one request that was very important uh, for the client. He didn't want to paint or clad or change anything in the future uh, regarding the future maintenance of the house. So uh, the structure became the, the result. The structure is the final um, cladding or the final um, condition of the house. And... Um, the different uh, platforms and stairs is a way of shifting the topography uh, without ever feeling you have a lot of stairs. So it's, very, it's a one floor house just with two uh, bedrooms in the upper floor and the roof terraces. So when you think you're entering the house, this is the, the entrance, so you, you're arriving to the house and you are sure you're going to open a door and enter um, an interior. And then suddenly you keep on walking and you enter an exterior. So it's a play of shifting the notions of um, inside and outside. And you encounter different views that are a surprise because every view uh, is really uh, has like an, another experience towards a new outside. And... These are the, the different stairs and the platforms that really make it seem not that steep. And you have, the, the house becomes a threshold. It um, communicates one exterior with another exterior, so you always have two or three different uh, orientations to have sun during the day and sun during the afternoon. And, and it's a house that changes completely during the day and during the night because you have these wonderful views during the day, everything is green and everything is beautiful, uh, but during the night, those green landscapes become just a black screen and you don't see anything. And there are places that are not safe at all, so the way to feel in a protected area that you actually can light and, and have like this uh, notion of uh, dwelling or of privacy or of intimacy, that's the courtyard. and. Um, so it's, um, it's a house that becomes one thing during the day and, and another during the night. Uh, I think of it as a glove or a sock that you turn it around and really uh, the inside becomes the outside and vice versa. So you have the possibility of lighting up during the night and, and feel really uh, safe and, and feel that you have views towards the outside. It's not just a black screen or yourself seeing, uh, reflecting in a mirror. And uh, the construction was very improvised. It, it, was a very, it, it is a very remote area, so we couldn't bring trucks or materials. Um, it was a very, it was a challenge <laughs> to bring everything to the mountain. And it was really uh, based on the hand labor, the skills of the construction workers with the stone, the local stone, local wood, and um, just using what we had in hand, and also taking advantage of the views and the roof terraces, um, especially because you need to harvest the rainwater, so there's um, a landscape design related to the cistern that's in the middle of the courtyard. The, the whole reason of the courtyard is also related to storing rainwater. It's a place where um, it rains six months, uh, every day during six months, and then you don't have rain for the next six months. So it's really a huge um, challenge to, to just live out of your own water. And, and the main challenge, uh, as I said before, making the house disappear in the landscape. 
And the second house, Casa Terreno, uh, just a five-minute walk from Casa Bruma, with the same conditions, making it completely self-sustainable, and influenced in Rudolf uh, Rudolfsky's drawings, trying to challenge again the relation between the interior and the exterior, what is the meaning of architecture and the relation with the landscape or um, with the environment. Again, uh, acknowledging the historical influence and relevance of the courtyards. In this case, a house with four courtyards. Um, again, the central one, this larger one for the cistern, and then a um, more private courtyard for the public areas. And as well, the bedrooms facing the east to have sun during the mornings and openings during the afternoon as well. So every space has two or three different orientations. And um, a small courtyard at the, at the entrance of the house and another courtyard for the caretaker's house. This again is a house for two families and sometimes three or even four. Uh, this is the entrance of the house because it's really a problem to get to the to the site. So uh, for me, it was very important that when you entered the house, you really felt you had arrived and the house welcomed uh, the people who finally had gotten there. But as well, you want to arrive to an exterior space. No? You, you drove to get to an open landscape. Uh, but again, since it's not a safe place, the interior needs to be, or the exterior needs to be, uh, in a way, a controlled interior. So what you encounter first when you enter is this, this space, and then immediately it's an open courtyard. So when you are about to enter the house, you will find yourself in an open landscape where you can frame the sky and see the mountains and really feel connected to the exterior. Um, also with the cistern, the cross ventilation and the idea of um, the materiality based on the difficulties of having any material um, transported to the, the site. In this case, it's a broken brick because uh, the brick came always a little bit torn. It, it wasn't in perfect shape. So the decision was to break it even more, make it um, taking advantage of the, like the accident becoming the intention. And um, also with lattice works, and as well, it's a glove or a sock that's turned inside out because the, the roughness and the red color of the exterior, then suddenly when you're in the interior, it's completely smooth. It's all uh, made with wood and concrete. You have vaulted ceilings and um, the extensions of the views towards the different orientations. Everything was made, again, with the local craft and local materials. And you have a rooftop terrace where the vaults become sort of um, uh, another landscape that mimics the surroundings. And uh, the house as well is intended to disappear in the, in the landscape. Then the next two houses, the low-income houses uh, in rural Mexico, this, uh, especially this one, was done after the earthquake. Well, both of them are, but this one um, is for Eva, who was a victim. She lost her house in 2017, but she was part of a group of um, women who had faced um, violence issues. So the house needed to be really um, a manifesto of safety and of sturdiness and very robust. She needed a house where she could feel really safe and keep her kids safe. And the program started to change really fast in, in the first visits and interviews. First, she had just two kids. Then suddenly a new kid appeared. It wasn't clear if it was her own kid or her grandson. Then two other uh, children appeared, and so the extended family. And, and I noticed right away that the house, despite the, the small, uh, it's just eight times four square meters, so 32 square meters. It's really um, for low-income housing, but it needed to house uh, different programs, changing needs and situations that were not going to be part of the initial brief. 
So it's uh, part of an idea to provide a prototype within the same shell or within the same structure, having the possibility to have three bedrooms or to place to work, place to store goods, or even a terrace. So changing needs within the same uh, structure and uh, taking advantage of uh, also storing rainwater directly on top of the, above the, the bathroom and the kitchen, so making the um, installations really, really simple and really cheap. The community uh, built the blocks of the, those houses. It's part of a pro bono initiative. 32 different houses were built. I, I built one, but they were all made with the same um, block that was just produced by the community with the local soil, also with local wood. So the idea to have this very um, firm or robust um, shell, but then in the inside filled with light, with double height, despite the, the very narrow uh, condition of the site. And um, it's a, a house that can extend also towards the exterior because some activities still take place in the outdoors, like cooking or laundry. So it's a house that wants to become a prototype for um, different houses that can also accommodate these different uses. And Casa Productiva is similar intention with the same idea of having the double height space. And in, in Spanish, we call tapanco. It came from the colonial pre-Spanish um, tradition and having different typological solutions within the same core or the same shell. In this case, again, uh, eight times four square meters. So different solutions to uh, have, again, the bathroom and the kitchen uh, attached together, storing rainwater as well. And that's why we have the, the roof this way, because you have um, the water tank on top. And that allows you to provide a double height space for the living area. I think here it's easier to understand. This is uh, like an extra bedroom or a place to work, whatever. And then you have also the possibility of having a patio or having uh, shifting the distance between the volume. So this is one house, this is another, but they can be connected or separated. So you can have a courtyard um, or a, a space in between the houses. You can actually shift them depending on the orientations. And you have this space that despite the narrow um, dimensions, it's really, you have a double height and full of light, always with cross ventilation as well as Casa Eva, and um, always thinking of opening up the house as, uh, as much as possible toward the exterior and having a small patio or uh, place to work and um, different solutions within the same, the same design. And as well, thought as a prototype that can actually um, take other activities and house different needs. And then the, the next projects are all of them in Naco and Agua Prieta. These are border, two border cities in, in the Sonoran Desert. And it was a project built during the pandemic for the federal government. It's, um, there are two cities or two towns uh, where you have the, the wall, which is really a very violent demarcation or a very violent division between the United States and Mexico. And the different programs, the first two are for two public buildings, one in Naco and one in Agua Prieta. The, um, as you can see, the landscape and everything is really um, shaped by the topography, the desert, and obviously by the wall. And here, um, this project is probably the, the building that's nearer to the wall that I can um, think of or that I have been able to find. I, I got really, really closed, illegally closed <laughs> to the wall. For me, it was very important to have that proximity and trying to change the understanding of a wall that always seems a very violent element and trying to make that wall become a place and become a park and a public space. 
So here you have the, the wall. It was just like the rear uh, or the back part of the houses uh, in this area. And this was to become a public park, a linear park. And then the, um, the library very near to the crossing. You have uh, the crossing is in Douglas in Arizona. You have more than four people crossing every day. And many people work there and even kids go to school there. So when the crossing, even parents go and take their kids, the bus comes, picks them up, and there's a lot of um, traffic in that area. And you don't have a bench, you don't have a bathroom, you don't have a shade. Uh, so the idea for me, uh, it was to transform the, the program or the brief of a library into um, just an open space, a park, and a public space to uh, transform this limit or this uh, barrier into an open place. Here it's, um, this is the area. And um, the excuse was to have this library, but it's not sure how these buildings are gonna be maintained in the future. Probably uh, there was nobody to take care of the books or whatever, so I designed the library thinking of uh, elevating it and building just a shaded space, a public space that's really open and available to everyone. And it's really connected to um, a ramp, getting as near as possible to the wall, being able to see the other side because there's always the intention to go to the other side and to cross um, to, to the United States. And that's um, not possible for many. So it's always like the desire of being in another place where you're not. For me, the project uh, became an excuse to be able to see the other side, but see themselves as well, to see their own side, and connect both different worlds. So you have this, this public space that really uh, connects both uh, areas, and you have the ramp that you can actually um, look at the other side and feel like really you're uh, breaking the limits and providing a public space with bathrooms, uh, restrooms, and a uh, place for um, like concerts and public gatherings, and having the, the ramp become just like a, a way of almost crossing, but then suddenly being able to see your own place and the values that are in that area. So I, I was sure that the construction was gonna stop when somebody saw these images, but. Fortunately, uh, that never happened. It, it becomes really like a new um, environment connected to the other side or, or lessening the violence or the divisions. And it was also very important to have this idea of the local materials becoming a new or having a new hierarchy, a new, a new in, um, qualifying them. No? Uh, like making them uh, really part of the new identity for the people of um, Agua Prieta. And in NACO, similar situation in this case for a market, which um, became, it was a very important part of the entrance of the city. It's when you're riding from the north to the US, you cross by NACO and the town uh, people, they, felt it's really dangerous because trucks and uh, it's a highway, a fast uh, highway or speed, and nobody acknowledges when they've entered NACO and when they left the town already. It's nothing that announces that, so they felt they needed an entrance to their city, so the market becomes that. And we also changed the area uh, to have a, like an open plaza and make the traffic slow down. We changed the circulations and try to open the market as much as possible, making it really a public space that connects the, this like, strange spot in between the highways. And it's always open and you have also a staircase to see above. There's wonderful mountains. And as I said before, people had have, have never seen their own town. It's those two towns have only uh, one floor buildings or maximum two levels. So they've never actually seen themselves from uh, above. And uh, in this case, the idea was to be able to enjoy the views, the landscape, not 
always being like um, divided by the wall, but seeing the, the other side as well, and uh, having this public open space that uh, in order to be safe, it needs to be always open. You never have glass or anything that can be broken or be stolen. So they're in a way like very harsh buildings, very uh, bulletproof with natural ventilation, very cheap um, maintenance, thinking of uh, the future of this, these buildings. And in the case of the civic centers, a very similar situation, one in Naco and the other one in Agua Prieta. Same materiality and same intentions of always being able to hear and see what's happening inside and um, taking advantage of the um, open ventilation, the circulations, because it's in the desert, it's really warm uh, and then really cold during the winter. So no air conditioning, obviously, no heating system, similar to the to the other houses, the, the very low income housing uh, projects and the two I initially showed have no, have no uh, infrastructure regarding um, air conditioning or heating systems. And in this case, you have courts, workshops, uh, cafeteria, restrooms. So it's really like a social uh, space where different activities can happen. It's a place where you have like a the picture for the graduation or a concert. They're the, like the only safe public spaces or the only public spaces uh, in the city. And it's always very open. And you have also the, the same intention. This one is much bigger, but it has the same intention of providing different spaces for different ages. Um, so uh, like recess areas, the courts, workshops, and always taking advantage of the wonderful views and having the least future maintenance uh, as possible. So these are places that um, never close and you need to have uh, the least possible amount of uh, lamps or the least possible expenses in the future. So it's, it's really uh, projects thought to be just left on their own in a way and respond to the changing needs of this community. Um, as I said before, for different ages, thinking places for kids, for older children, even for the elderly. Uh, this one, especially for the elderly in Naco, these are the, the next two community centers. Uh, this is uh, the smallest project of the series um, of this of these projects, and it's um, a place to have medical assistance, to have workshop facilities, a dining area, or, or a place to, to have lunch, and uh, developed around the central courtyard, again, to have uh, as much open space as possible, but having a very like, safe interior space, although you are um, taking advantage of framing the sky, being able to be on the outside, but having shade. You know, the sun is uh, really an issue here. And they're in office spaces and workshop facilities on the rear part of the project. And um, again, just very simple materials, but with the intention of uh, making these buildings having like a long lasting um, solution and connecting it with the outside as well, providing a sense of identity in places that lack completely a sense of identity. Uh, this is the biggest community center, and uh, this one is in Agua Prieta, and it's a place for, um, it has uh, kids' uh, playrooms, it has an auditorium, it has cafeterias, so a very complex programs for different ages as well. This is the open auditorium, and developed around a series of courtyards as well, trying to um, make platforms between the different topographical conditions and uh, connecting it always with the outside, making them really public, really uh, welcoming everybody inside and uh, having the connection toward the street so people can actually see what's happening and feel invited, feel they can enter and be part of these community centers. So that there is, you never have a door, you never have a glass um, window that can break. They're really uh, thought for easy maintenance. 
And, and then the last two projects, the, um, they have nothing to do related with uh, the same typology, but for me, uh, they're good examples of trying to link the, um, the boundaries between the um, housing solutions or the domestic typology and then the public buildings. Because uh, in a way for me, the, my work is an attempt to blur those divisions between the public and the private, or between what's mine and what's yours, or the rich and the poor, or the rural and the urban. So it's a, um, an excuse, again, of changing the brief as much as possible to connect with other interests and other things that can happen, even if it's a residential project for a client, but trying to make houses be more for more activities, for more people, um, and uh, public projects to feel to, to be a house for anyone. You know? So trying uh, to, to break those boundaries. Uh, the first one is a house in the same development that I showed, Casa Terreno and Bruma. So as well, it uh, stores rainwater, it has to be completely self-sufficient. And in this case, it's um, a bigger house in the central part of the plot. Then a studio, this, this was an addition uh, during the pandemic, the client um, asked for an office space or for a, st a separated studio from the house, and then the caretaker's house in another area, and a central courtyard, again, the same idea, they're reinventing or restudying the courtyard typology, and uh, opening up the house as much as possible, taking advantage of the roof as a terrace, and uh, the cistern uh, all around in the, in the central place. And it's a house that despite the fact that it has, this is uh, again a house for just one family, but then the caretaker's family, and they have five children, the owners, and as well needed a house for guests. So it's a um, house with many, many beds, but despite the fact that they needed a, a very big space, the um, uh, possibility of gathering every part of the program through a central courtyard really uh, made circulations become terraces or become part of the courtyard and also uh, allows for the extension of the bedrooms towards the other side. So again, the house becomes a threshold between one sort of views that you discover when you go one way and then the central courtyard that is the main area of the, of the house, and then the studio that's um, in the rear part of the plot, and connecting the house with the um, uh, furniture that's outside, trying to have, again, the division between the inside and the outside blurred as much as possible, or finding different thresholds within that threshold. No? So it's like the gradients of privacy and the gradients of uh, interior uh, extend as much as possible. And then having the, the usual program for a living room, uh, dining room, whatever. But as you can see, uh, it's a rounded house, a circular house, but you never have uh, any strange shaped room. All of the rooms are um, rectangular. You never have like an uncomfortable wall, except for the walls that are just in the courtyard, which are not, uh, walls that you need to to use in, in a standard manner. So it's a very functional house and it's always very open and as well has uh, different ways of connecting with one side and the other, having the orientations as the ones I showed before, sun in the morning, sun in the afternoon in every space and then making the house disappear as well. It's just like a ring that you can barely notice and um, taking advantage of the, the views. You have 360 degrees. Uh, that's why the name is 720 because for me the, there's a house in the ground floor and then you have another house that you encounter when you go up the terrace and it's another view completely different. Uh, so that's why it's like for me two houses. Uh, and actually it's also 720 because you have one house that's on the inside of the courtyard and then the other house that faces the outside. So having one ring, it always has like one ring to the inside, one to the outside. And this is the studio. 
And then the last project is uh, Pilares, which is in Iztapalapa. This is a community center in Mexico City. It was, it, it was a very complex project because um, it's in a place, Iztapalapa, it was an informal settlement when I was born in the 70s. And then it became a city or part of the city with more than 2 million inhabitants within Mexico City. So it's a place that grew informally without uh, public space, with no, um, not even sidewalks. And this project it was commissioned by the federal government. It's an um, area just be just behind the um, the prison Reclusorio Oriente is the largest and more densely populated prison that we have, male prison that we have in Mexico. And it's a huge neighbor. And this is a project just 500 square meters. It was to be a very small community center, uh, only one floor. It's for obviously safety reasons. But uh, the intention was how can you provide a place where you really feel outside and, and have this sense of um, publicness or a public condition open to the street, making it like really available, uh, welcoming everyone, but not seeing the neighbor. So how can you disappear such a huge neighbor? This is the site and these are the views. So you always have the towers, you have the fences. It's a very violent uh, area. This is just one block. Imagine the size. This is a regular size block of any city. And this is the prison. So it's um, more than 100,000 square meters. And this yellow uh, rectangular is the, the site. So I had a huge, huge neighbor. So the scale, everything was like really uh, complicated. And um, so th this is the this is small project. And the idea was to be able to sh uh, frame views the feeling outside without looking at the, the prison. So that was achieved through a series of courtyards, in this case four uh, very small organic shape circular patios. And then the whole program is developed in this like horse shape or, or C um, structure with very cheap materials. The largest span is four square meters, so barely just like from this wall to this um, step and a uh, very, very low, high ceiling, and uh, facilities for a computer center, a workshop for um, craft, for carpentry, for metal work, um, dancing lessons, so different programs in, in all of these spaces, and always open toward the courtyard and then toward two different uh, gardens on the site. So you have, uh, in the other projects, cross ventilation, natural light, two different orientations. And then the courtyards allow to frame the sky, feel that you are outside, but you never notice um, the context. So they're really intimate and they always open up towards the classrooms or the, the workshop facilities. Uh, the exterior is always visible through this lattice work. It's done with uh, terracotta brick, and um, the, um, there are never aisles or corridors. In a similar way to the projects in Agua Prieta and Naco, everything needs to be visible, everything needs to, to be open, and um, obviously no air conditioning, no... Uh, I mean, the climate in Mexico City, it's, we, we really have spring all year round, uh, but still we need to... Um, I mean, you don't want to get wet, and you know, so it, it's a way of having the uh, ideal conditions of um, closed space, but always being open. So it's the corridors extend as terraces or as small gardens, and you have this connection of every uh, space with two orientations, and having these courtyards that uh, house different programs. They have been appropriated sometimes with um, cans or tires or vegetation, uh, different uses. Uh, one as an auditorium, another one for uh, dancing lessons. So the program really changes. And uh, despite the, the very cheap and regular structure, very, very 
all is an apparent uh, concrete, invisible concrete, but we have the lattice that was uh, uh, just built with terracotta, and that um, second skin of the program or of the project has organic shape, so it really relates with a kinder or a more uh, subtle way of relating with the outside. It's not the very plain horizontal um, facade, but it's in a way making um, movement and making it visible. Everything that happens in the inside and the outside is communicated, despite the fact that it's, that it's closed. So uh, this is the, the actual condition of the place. This is Iztapalapan. This is the way that it has been improvised and grown um, through the years. So for me, it was very important to play with the same cards, with the same materials, instead of bringing an, um, like an imposed um, object or a project that brought other materials or other languages or other references for me, it was really important to play with their own, um, with their own materials, with uh, what they have in hand. So it's really trying to give another hierarchy to their own, um, their own materials and their own ways of building, of working. And then instead of imposing an, an element or, or diminishing their own way of self-built construction, it was really important to say. Um, this is for you with the same materials, with your same uh, idiom, you know, with, the, with the same intentions, but giving it, requalifying it, or making it um, really something that can be appreciated if it's acknowledged as something that can be desired. You know? uh, and just to finish, three images of um, the artist Lorena Wolfer. Um, his, she's a Mexican artist, uh, that in a way I think relate to my work especially considering um, the, the intention to blur the divisions between the private and the public. And she asks, this is not a billboard, this is a public space. Who controls the public? Who designs it? Who's in charge of it? And uh, where does the public begin? Where does it end? And um, thank you, thank you for listening. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you so much for your talk. I uh, enjoyed every single one of the projects and your overall approach to architecture. At the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned this idea of unlearning architecture. Could you expand a little bit on that and some of the things that you've had to unlearn as an architect? Yes, almost everything. It's um, very important to question the uh, givens, especially because um, less is not more, bigger is not better, and uh, fucking the context did not work well. So um, I've been trying to rethink this, this um, slogans, these teachings, these um, stereotypes all along. The most important ones, I think, that deal with these divisions, these polarizations of what I mentioned, the inside, the outside, what's yours, what's mine, what if belongs to one, what affects us all. So trying not to think about architecture as just buildings, uh, but rather all of the other possibilities of relating living entities with the environment, and uh, with an inhabitation in a wider sense. One more. One question here. I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm from Mexico City, as you know. <laughs> 
Um, but I, it's sort of a double question that looking at, at your work here, which is admirable. I read, I, I just, I read her book, so uh, and this is uh, a little bit more wonky, but in Mexico City, there are a couple of, of things that I see in this kind of work. The first one is that it is a city that was really built in many ways by abstract art, art and abstract architecture. So I was wondering, you know, all the Chapultepec was built with abstraction, mm -hmm. right? El Pedregal with Barragan. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of, of the aesthetics of abstract art in these contemporary projects, but also moving from sort of these ratified elite spaces into these uh, places that are both in the border, in the marginal neighborhoods of Mexico City. Uh, and the second one, uh, since you have a book entitled The Right to, to Architecture, or The Right to Housing, mm -hmm. right? I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on how your projects connect with the idea that architecture is a right for, for citizens and not a commodity that you purchase. And because that is a very stark contrast between mm -hmm. your two kinds of projects that you presented to us. Yes, two wonderful questions, very difficult ones. Um, for the first one, I, I think Mexican architecture is obviously related to this notion of abstract design, very elitistic, but it's, uh, it's worldwide. And I think it's something that we inherited since the Renaissance, since the perspective of the universal um, male figure standing with a certain model proportions, fixed point of view, very, very abstract, always related to um, humans as the creators and the in only inhabitants or the only ones in, in question. <laughs> and uh, that's something that needs to change. It happened obviously with Luis Barragan, with the Pedregal, with all of our developments. It's still happening today. But I think more and more we are acknowledging the need of not designing from uh, the top or from the distance and actually understanding places better. Um, we need to stand in the places where we work with uh, not, not only standing superficially, but actually acknowledging all the layers that come uh, before us and that are around us that architecture, I think, was not considering or is rarely considering still today. Um, and then regarding the, the question, the right to architecture, um, and the wrong architecture that we, that we continuously uh, build. Um, I think that uh, along with this change of perspective or change of, uh, it's not our point of view that's going to be the prevalent one anymore. It's also the notion of private property and uh, the house as a commodity also needs to change. It's not going to be uh, that in the future, hopefully. So new ways of inhabiting, new ways of collectivity or of cohabitation uh, need to be uh, invented. And also not only in terms of who owns what or wh what affects who, because um, before a house was just meant to be a private matter for an individual or for a family, it was um, their problem. And now we finally acknowledge that uh, houses are not individual entities. They're not, um, uh, it's not about the decisions of one person or one family, but actually the social or the collective implications of those individual decisions when you multiply them uh, by millions, uh, that's the world that you get. So trying to figure out other ways of um, of defining ownership, of sharing, the advantages of sharing, and um, of not making strict divisions between living and working, um, I don't know, between the interior, the exterior, the owners, the dispossessed, the resources, the waste, the rural, the urban. No, we have been um, learning uh, all of the oppositions, the, the dual polarization of every word, and now we need to integrate them in new definitions for a non-domestic future, and I would say even for a non-architectural future. Thank you so much. This was a really nice closing statement from you, and I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs>